Okay, and let the games begin. Okay, y'all, we are starting over. I'm sorry, we just had so much divine energy happening. It literally fried the server. I don't know if that's <laughs> true, but that's what I'm going with. So I'm just gonna run through the rules again real quick. Three figures. Namna's here for Mami Wata. Um, Jordan's here for Oshun. I'm here for Anansi. Um, and there's going to be several rounds. It'll be one on one until it's a three on three. That's not correct. One on one on one. And you guys can vote in the polls. Um, I'm going to start over from the first question so y'all not missing anything. And we're just going to keep on rolling. If you don't get it, you will pick it up. I believe in you. Okay. So question number one from the top once more again. Now I'm going to 30 seconds. Let me pull up my little timer. Okay. So question one. First round is Oshun versus Mamiwata. And the question once more, both Oshun and Mamiwata are invited to walk the red carpet at the Oscars. Who has the nomina vanished? Oh no. Okay. And she's back. <laughs> look, you guys look just this is live TV, y'all. Live TV. Okay. So <laughs> Oshun versus Mami Wata. Both of them are invited to walk the red carpet at the Oscars. Who has the fiercest look and why? Mamina. Three, two, one, go. Mami Wata is the goddess of all waters in the world, all the oceans, all the rivers. So she is undeniably going to be the most fierce because she has access to every precious jewel there is. She's also the goddess of wealth and sensuality and beauty. So literally, she will show up um, wearing diamonds from like here to Mali. She can do that because she's Mami Wata. Also, Jordan said to me, no stealing. But again, let me reiterate, I believe that Oshun is a type of Mami Wata, which means that Mami Wata is the top, she's the everything. Oh, yes. Stop. You're Break it up, people. Break it up. Okay. Good job. Jordan, same question. Why does your person have the best look at the Oscars? Three, two, one, go. Oshun is the original goddess of life, love, and beauty. She was there at the creation of the world, which is about as original as you can get. And she is worshipped everywhere Black diaspora are, all the all different regions of Africa, all different regions of South America, Central America. And so she would have the fabrics and the dyes and the beauty of all of those places. She is the original international slay mama. She would have a little bit of a shoke. She would have a dire cloth. She would have kente. She would have it all. Thank you for stopping her as she speaks for us. <laughs> also, kente is gone, so she can't claim kente by. But anyway, anyway, this is not my round. I'm staying out of this. But okay. <laughs> second half of the first round. This time, Jordan, you get to go first, and then Nana. So the second question of the round. So who would be most useful in a fantasy magic battle against an evil overlord? Oh, shooter, Mami Wata. Jordan, three, two, one, go. Oshun's origin story is that the original male spirits tried to create the world without her and failed. And so she had to convince them, these strong men who didn't want to make her, let her, to let her help. And that's the only way the world got created. If she can handle her own like jerk big brothers, she can handle an evil overlord. If you can defeat your friends, you can definitely defeat your enemies. Ocean would have no trouble at all. She would use not only the powers of the river and of life itself, but I think she'd also have some seduction in there. <laughs> Thank you, Jordan. <laughs> now I'm gonna same question. Why is Mami Wata the person you want riding into you battle Lord of the Ring style? Three, two, one, boom. Um, Mami Wata does not just have one river. She has all the waters in the world. She could literally yawn and drown a person. Like <laughs> literally just yawn, drown, done. That's the whole thing there. But she wouldn't need to because again, she is the goddess of sexuality and sensuality. So all she'd need to do is bat her eyes. It doesn't matter, male, female, gender diverse. It doesn't matter. All she needs to look at a person and they will bow down before her and give her everything she wants. So she doesn't even need to fight. She'll just be like, sit here, baby, and let me take care of you. Now give me everything. Thing I want. So stop. Yeah. Stop. <laughs> okay, y'all. You have now heard both arguments to both questions. Y'all vote in that little poll there. I'll give you a couple seconds to vote before we start for the next round. Um, for my verdict there. Okay, so for the first question, I think for the first question, I think I gotta give it to Mommy Wata because like just the idea of like the sea inspired. I'm just, like no, you made a good call, but like just the idea of the sea inspired look. Like I know Osha's more of like a gold kind of person, right? But like. 
the, I'm just like the sea. I just I'm seeing in my head, but but for the battle, I'm like I think Ocean. I just feel like Mommy Watson. The problem is, if like in, you're in the Sahara, how is she gonna fight? Like there's no water. Like Chicken, I feel like Ocean, there's groundwater. What you mean? <laughs> But the groundwater is too deep. But like, I just feel like There's ocean is more, is more versatile in, in terms of a battle. So that's, I'm one on one, on one, one for each there. And she can walk around naked. That's it. Babble done. <laughs> <laughs> like, no, I have okay. to, it's actually a pretty good point. Yeah, like, <laughs> that, that, is, that is a fair point. But I just, assuming that there's actual like combat that. needs to happen here. I just, I just, she's, she's too hindered by the water thing there. But, okay, y'all. So next round, this time it is Mami Wata versus Anansi. That's me. So Jordan, you can you're gonna be kind of the decider here on this one. Okay, I'll um, tell you. Um, Wait, but did we get an answer on the last question of who won from ooh, audience? I, I guess it depends. Do we want to go audience round? Like, do we want to do them all at the end and like count up who won the most rounds, or do we want to as we go see what the audience says? We could do either, but doesn't that? Um, I think let's do as um as we go audience. Yeah, because that's, yeah, yeah. Okay. Family, okay. So let's see then, poll number one, let's see. So uh, for round one, for the Oscars question, Mami Wata won that one. Mami Wata won the Oscars question, but Oshun won the fan fantasy battle question. So uh, the audience- Hiss. Yep. Boo, so, yeah. hiss. <laughs> I will not respond because Ocean Goddess of Love is my patron saint. Oh, that's actually- <laughs> <It's generous. Yeah, laughs> What? The, they're actually actively changing as I'm looking at it. So at the very end, we'll come back and we'll look at okay. all of them again. Yeah, yeah. As of right now, Mommy Wata oh, yeah. won Oscars, but Ocean won Battle. Okay. So. <laughs> all right. And so so now round two, Mommy Wata versus Anansi. So Mommy, okay. Mommy, yeah. Do you have the question, Shorty? Can you ask them? Or um, Yes, absolutely. Um, do you want to reintroduce Anansi again, or are we good? Do we just, since it's been a um, little Okay, I'll do quick reintroduction. Okay. Anansi, goddess of stories, tricksters, just intelligence. Just basically, anytime you have seen anything cool happen, Anansi was there. Okay. <laughs> that, that's all y'all know. All right. Um, so, Nomina will go first again as our celebrant. Um, your question is, and you have 30 seconds, between Mami Wata and Anansi, who would be the first to get eliminated on the bachelor slash bachelorette slash genderless single person? <laughs> Nollywood edition. Go. Um, so it would definitely be Mami and Mata would be, be the one who won. Let's be clear. Because first of all, she would be the one who was seducing everybody. She would like literally by the end of the day have like everybody just be her lovers. Because that is, again, it is the goddess of sensuality and sexuality. You cannot compete. Who can... Who can like even step against her? You know, like imagine she's like the messiest, best, most wonderful person that you could ever have on such a show okay, because time. like everybody. Time. <laughs> <laughs> all right. And all right. So for um Rosie representing Anansi, um, why would he why would he win the Bachelor slash Bachelor at Nollywood Edition? So here's the thing, the argument that Mami Wata can seduce everyone, the point of the bachelor slash bachelorette slash single uh, non-gender romance competition is not to seduce everyone, it's to seduce the main person. You're out here seducing everyone, you lose. And honestly, he will know the person, whoever is being, in like whoever is, I'm just gonna use bachelor here just as a general, whoever is the bachelor of that round, he will know their favorite color, their flower, what they love, best date. Like he will know their family inside and out. Cause the Nazi, he does reconnaissance. He will be in there. He will be Hi. on it. Like Donkey Kong, the Nazi will be in there. And what he is reconnaissance him. against just love? <laughs> Cause she's spreading the too thin. She's spreading the love too thin. The job she is not to spread it. the love too thin. It's she to spread have, The woman has like a million like lovers fun per second. That would possibly. <laughs> <laughs> okay. So, um, do we want to look at the polls? Do you want to hear my verdict? My verdict would be: I was, I was, I was feeling guilty because I was like, "Oh, this would be such an easy question for Mommy Wata," but actually, Rosie makes a good point. Like, if the bachelor slash bachelorette slash non gender non conforming person saw Mommy Wata flirting with everybody, I don't know. I don't know. I don't think she'd get that rose. But that um, is her power: is that they don't, they don't, they don't care because they just want to be with her. 
But I don't count. I don't think that's. Like, I don't think that counts. And and also, that's against the I point of the bathroom. Add that all of this reconnaissance sounds a lot like manipulation. <laughs> yeah, it's not manipulation. You're allowed to research. Like, hasn't anyone here ever done like a social media dive when you're about to go on a date? It's like that, but like with magic. That sounds like stalker. <laughs> and Nancy's a stalker. Um. So, oh wait, they made a good point. So someone's asking, is it who wins or who goes home first? So I guess technically the question is flipped for this one. If you think Mommy Wato would win, say Anansi would go home. If you think Anansi would win, say Mommy Wato would come home. <laughs> Does that work? Yeah. Okay. Yeah, we got a little bit twisted there. I don't get it. Like that. my head is hurting now. <laughs> Y'all know. <laughs> okay. So um, do we want to look at the polls? Or do we want to do the second one first? I think let's, let's do the, the second, second one, one first. Yeah. And we'll see overall. Okay, okay, okay. <laughs> um, all right, so your second question is, this time starting with Rosie, um, who would, well, the, the questions are preloaded in the poll, isn't it? Okay, so who would be the first to crack after a year in war, in quarantine? Go. Mommy Watson would crack before Anansi because the thing is, Anansi traditionally, fun fact, actually is a worth it, worshipped. He's a mythological figure, but he's not a god in traditional Akan mythology. So he doesn't need worship to survive, aka he don't need people around him. Mommy <laughs> Watson, she needs a devotion, she needs a prayer, she needs people all the time. If she's isolated, like, she's just gonna like, little melt into a little puddle. She's like, oh, my people aren't around me. Oh, Anansi, <laughs> he's there. He made his web himself. He don't need nobody. Anansi is chilling, quarantine. He is good. He does not need these people all around him. <laughs> oh, I am so ready for this rebuttal. <laughs> <laughs> I'm so ready. All right, all right. Navina, and go. OK, so for Amami Wata would only ascend to higher heights of fame because in quarantine, she would find TikTok, she would find Instagram, she would be on there posting 24 seven. She would only ascend her fame because now she'll have people following her digitally, like sending her roses digitally, all right? So like, no, this would actually be just a situation where she gains more fame, more acclaim, more ever, and she would just soak it up because this is perfectly the thing for her, everybody, Everybody can focus on her because they have nothing else to focus on. <laughs> <laughs> oh, crap. That was actually really hard. <laughs> I don't know. I don't know. I don't know, but the thing is she's... Okay, sorry, go ahead. So the question is who would crack? So it's would a really... She, would she have an OnlyFans? <laughs> <laughs> go wrong for that one. Go wrong for that question. That is disrespectful. You can crack and, and go overboard on TikTok, I would say. Right. <laughs> so, but on the other hand, if she's sustained by adoration, maybe she'd be more sane than ever. Yeah. That's a hard I one. Don't know. TikTok <laughs> attention's not good attention. Like y'all, the attention that someone like praying gives and the attention someone swiping through TikTok gives, not the same thing. Not the same <laughs> energy there. Oh, tell that to TikTok stars. <laughs> <laughs> I know that's not whole energy. Not whole energy. She said as she sipped from her little pink glass, <laughs> gold rim glass. <laughs> Yeah, I don't know. I don't know. Well, I am ready to, it looks like in the results, um, the first to get eliminated, um, I know this was so, this was so confusing because it's, it's switched for these, but just by a margin, Anansi would be the first, would be, would get eliminated before Mami Wata. And in round two, Mami Wata would crack before Anansi. <laughs> yeah! <laughs> So it looks like it looks like they're neck on neck for now in terms of who won the last round. Thank but. you for recognizing my wine glass. It has a gold rim. I, <laughs> like I came matching and prepared. Okay, okay. You really did. You, did, you really did. Cannot deny that. <laughs> All right then. And so last round is, um, well, no, second to last round. There's a fourth one. Anansi versus Oshun. And so okay. Namna, do you? Do you, do you have the questions club nominal or do you need me to read the questions? Either I need you to time. read them because I have no idea. Like, how about okay. for you? I'll, I'll do the timer for you, Rosie, and you can do the timer for me. <laughs> <laughs> okay, then. Okay. So for this third round, then, it is Anansi versus Ocean. So it's me versus Jordan. Namna, you've got the verdict here. And so for the first question, Jordan, you can go first. So for the first question is, who would have the more interesting reality TV show, Anansi or Ocean? So ready? Three, two, one. Oshun has a cohort of demi goddesses called the Iyami Aje, and they would make the most, the messiest, and best, and endearing 
Black Goddess Sorority House because one of their duties is helping people fall in love and have children. And can you imagine the drama when one Ayami Ajay matches up a couple that another Ayami Ajay wanted to use and Oshun's over here maybe seducing one of the people herself. Like it would be so messy and so entertaining. <laughs> Stop, okay. And so that was my part, you got the timer ready? Okay, yes. All right, and go. So the thing is about you want messiness, Anansi is hated by his own family. Like you guys can keep up with Kardashians. They got like some beef. Anansi got beef with everybody in Guardian Mythology. Yame, his dad, Asase God, his mother. There's different gods like Tano, Bia, Antoine. Like just all of them hate him. His own children hate him. His wife hates him. But he's also the OG. Like y'all, just imagine just like this keeping up with the Kardashians, like African God style, like meets everybody meets, everybody hates Chris, meets family matters. Cause like deep down, like they all got each other, they all got each other, right? Like that show, that show, the energy would be immaculate. The ratings would be sky high every day. The fan edits on Twitter are just never ending. Like everybody would be there for that. Like on reality TV, like the thing is, Anansi is just so problematic. You were out of time a long time ago. <laughs> <laughs> I have to say, man, Rosie, you tried, you really did. But like, <laughs> it is, for me, there's a clear winner. <laughs> like, of I think you're biased. It's because you guys <laughs> both, have, both have crowns. I think I've been getting up on here. It has nothing to do with that. I was just thinking, keeping up with the Kardashians, all of them just like lounging about in the, like their dark brown skin, just being ridiculous. <laughs> that's that's a Nazi in his family. The Ghanaian God family is keeping up with Kardashians. I'm just saying. Mm. <laughs> he, he misses the, the cute factor though. He is he's less cute. I will say he is less cute than Ocean. Yeah. Well, and Ocean's Ocean Show could have guest stars, the people they're trying to hook up. There's that. <laughs> you gotta get started too. Okay. But okay, so for the next question then, we said who would be more likely to end the world if they got angry? Oh, okay. Um, do you wanna go first since I went first? <laughs> yes, I think it's my turn okay, to go first. Okay. All right, and go. Okay, so this one seems like a landslide. I get it, Mother Goddess, all that stuff. I get it, but y'all gotta think. Look, y'all know anything from Game of Thrones? The person who comes with the biggest army is not always the person who is the strongest. See, the thing is, Anansi got that Tyrion mind. He's going like the thing is, he does not even need to like pull this whole big like all fireworks. Like he just needs to go to the right like um world leaders. He needs to just whisper in their ear like, "Hey, man, I think you should push some nuclear codes. Just twist them up a little bit. Boom, nuclear war." And he gets to use less energy to do that because you don't have to use any divine magic and all that. Because that's how Anansi works. Anansi works the plan, and he would just make it happen. So Anansi's little finger, basically. <laughs> yes, Anansi's little finger. And sometimes you need little finger. You don't need like Tyrion, uh, Tywin Lannister. All right. Okay. I'll, all right. Let me pull up your thing. So more likely to end the world. Go. Any of you who has a black mama or knows a black mama knows the phrase, I brought you into this world and I can take you out. <laughs> Ocean, being there when the world was made, knows how to dismantle it and she knows how to make it hurt with the anger of a black mama being a fertility goddess. So you don't wanna be around when she gets angry. I, I feel like you would just see darkness you know, like kind of like a movie monster where you like feel a flicker behind you and you're like, what was that? And then you're just gone. That's oh. okay. <laughs> uh, I would like to add though, that Ocean is also more forgiving. So she's also less likely to end the world. A Nazi's petty as fuck and a Nazi, someone just like gets a Starbucks order wrong and then he just end the world. And the question is who's more likely? Honestly, a Nazi, because Ocean loves people. Like Ocean deep down, she is not a vengeful person. She's loving, she would not end the world. A Nazi would because he's bad, because he sucks. <laughs> <laughs> oh, no. Ooh, I can't decide. Okay. I'm gonna let y'all decide. I know Rosie's argument is actually really good. I know Rosie's <laughs> argument, <laughs> argument is, is compelling. Compelling or compelling. Remember is that an, a Nazi, like in our stories, a Nazi is often the bad guy. Like there's as yeah, many but, stories of a Nazi triumphing, there's also Sharon him said, failing. A Nazi would want wants to keep the game going. That's true. Um, I, 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 I don't know. I, I can't come up with I can come up with several examples where Nancy was just like, F all y'all, and he just took the story, he just ruined it for everyone. He's everybody. like, I'm out, you know? I'm done with this. Yeah, so he would- <laughs> Y'all irritate me. I believe. Like, he just gets annoyed, he'd just be like, world done, world, I'm sick of this, I, my, they got my chai latte wrong at Starbucks, we're ending the world, it's over. <laughs> <laughs> He's like, I, I ordered, <laughs> I ordered oatmeal milk, oat milk, I ordered oat milk. Oat milk. I done. always say oatmeal milk. Am I the only that's, one who that's does That's not right. This? That, that's oh, yeah. not correct. Yeah, right, that so, just makes me think of like drinking oatmeal. 
No. So we have one more round? Um, I think that is the last one, just like a talk about, I oh, guess. Yeah, just okay. In general, make a, a kind of a last kind of, oh, but, but who won this round? Okay, Um, currently it's, okay, so right now Ocean's winning, but by one vote, an vote, announcing team, we can still get this. We can still get this. Who's more likely to end the world that got angry? I'm just saying, y'all, not too late to change your voice and vote and join the winning team. But, okay. <laughs> but, okay, so our last question, this one's a general three-way fee for all. Nominate can go first. And for this one, I say, should we do a minute for this one because it's the last one? Or is, should we I mean, still want to I think 30 seconds. Cause... 30 seconds. Ask yeah. about the ones and stuff. Yeah. <laughs> got it, got it. All right, so y'all, for this, 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 we're all gonna answer this one. So we'll go Namna, Jordan, then me. And so, why, out of all the figures across the variant African mythologies, plural, because we know Africa is not a monolith, and all the different cultures and peoples all have different mythologies. So, out of all those wide, wonderful, different things you could have worked with, why did you pick this figure to um, for today? And why did they speak to you? And why do they? What do they mean to you personally? So, ready. My phone died, go. <laughs> so honestly, I consider um, Mami Wata my personal touchstone because when I was growing up, we lived, this was our house. This was the marsh, saltwater marsh that connected to the beach. And people used to say that Mami Wata would come and sleep in the um, sleep in the marsh at night. And um, my grandmother and I would stand on the veranda and would watch people come at night to go worship her. So she's always been a part of my life. And... Um, my grandmother always used to tell me that if I was naughty, uh, Mami Wata would come take me away. And I was just like, really? Oh, that's amazing. <laughs> so I'd be naughty and then I'd, I'd list all the things that I did hoping she'd come take me and she never did. I'm waiting on her though. Waiting. Oh, cool. Okay. And you're done. That, that, I heard that story. I still think the fact you want to get spirited away is wild, but okay. <laughs> and so Jordan, same question. Why Oshun? What does she mean to you? 30 seconds, go. Oshun was one of the first images I saw of a beautiful dark-skinned woman being worshipped, being revered, and not being out of fear for what people thought, you know, she would do to them, like the whole like strong black or angry black woman, but because they loved her. And that's so special to me. And one portrayal of Oshun that actually resulted in my writing career. Um, it was a Beyonce concert. It was the one where she had the gold halo and then all the other women as her Ayami Aje. I was like, I love that image. I'm gonna write a story about it. And that story got published and that published story got me an agent and that agent got Ray Bear published. <laughs> so Ocean is great. <laughs> well, love that. I love y'all bringing it, you're bringing it back. You're bringing it deep, bringing it deep, deep. Okay, and I already have the timer so I can just time myself for this one. So ready. So the thing about for me, Ananti, he is a storyteller and oral storytelling is so ingrained so deeply in the various West African cultures and Ghanaian culture specifically. And for me, story saved my life, like quite literally, like the power of story as a form of connection with like my people, with my culture and with this idea that I'm an immigrant, right? So I, and I grew up in America, but I was born in Ghana. And the Anansi represented this connection to like who I was, my legacy, my ancestry, my heritage. And this idea that the stories are how we remember who we are and where we come from. And, what it means to be us, even when we're not in our ancestral land. And oh God, there I go. But, and so Anansi, that's what he represents for me. Like Anansi is the idea of story and story is why I'm here with y'all today. Ooh, y'all, I just really want to quickly say that all three of us are actually friends. We all know each other, we all speak, and there is no one I'd rather be here with at this time and this night than with you all. Cause like, this is just making me sort of feel emotional. I, I want to know. Oh my gosh. <laughs> I like. I, I literally text like, oh. these women like you. You won't believe this mess. <laughs> yeah. there's, there's always a new mess, though. There's always a mess, but we can talk about that later because we still have the Q and A section. But yes, let's do let's it. Let's see. do it. Okay. So wait, we first have our last, the last overall. Who won the overall? Let's see. Okay. We have. Ooh, 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 ooh! It's changing. It's changing. We but right now, M Mommy Wata is in the lead. Oh, oh Mommy Wata, let's go, Mommy Wata, let's go. And me and Jordan were both tied. Apparently, people really want you to get abducted by spirits, Namina. That's what I'm thinking. <laughs> that people yeah, want you know, like, abducted by spirits. When I die, a mermaid will come out of the water and take me. Watch. It's that, gonna that, happen. That's it's I gonna happen. Hope that happen. And I will be uh, that is awful. happy. And then I'll come back and haunt y'all. It's gonna be great. <laughs> yeah, I'll, I'll be at your funeral like you know <laughs> Namina died how she lived in a very terrifying manner. <laughs> 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 I think I'd be a great ghost. What are you talking about? That's true. I would I yeah, I'd just my be house. chilling, so like casting aspersions on how y'all live in your life. Exactly. Like, I don't need what is this nonsense I, I, now? Listen, look, I have enough anxiety. I do not need your voice like, mm, 
mm, I don't like those shoes that outfit. I'd be like, nope, not gonna say I would do that too. I really would. <laughs> get out of here. No, no, I don't need that. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> All right. So who who is the winner? Who is the winner? Uh, I don't know how to count. Um, <laughs> uh, <laughs> remember to them for my weird questions in the middle. That was so confusing. I'm sorry. Um, let's see. Yeah. I don't even know so where y'all are looking. I'm not going to try because then my stuff. <laughs> y'all know I'm not good at technology. It's very sad. Okay. You are too lit. I'm going to give this. Jordan can count. Jordan, where you can count. I Liberal <laughs> arts majors. This was doomed from the start. <laughs> okay. So for Oshun, we got 10, 24, and then, oh, these are, let's see, more interesting realities. Oh, wait, wait, wait. Okay, yeah. Um, okay, just say Mami Wata won it. Why are we even doing this? Why are we going to like this? Jordan, how about you just count general? Like, who won round one, question one? Who won round two? And whoever won the most rounds? Let's just do that. That's faster. Oh, right. I'm here counting individual votes. I'm so sorry. Okay. Oh. Yeah, round, let's, let's not do that. Round one goes to Mami Wata. <laughs> so Mami mm -hmm. Wata is this hand. Um, round two. Oh, crap. It was a, the second question was a tie between Ocean and Mami Wata. So that's one so point for them. Um, so that's two for Mami Wata, one for Oshun, one for mm -hmm. Anandi. Rosie, keep track of your points. <laughs> okay. One, one for Mami Wata. So that's three for Mami Wata, I think. Mm -hmm. uh, yeah, three. Yeah. Got so for, one for Oshun. Um, and then, um, oh, Anansi and Oshun tied. So one more for Anansi. Woo! Uh, for yeah. Um, Mami Wata run the, yeah, Mami Wata run. <laughs> Woo! Yes! Yes! yes. I dad, like, you know, if this was an African, like, whatever, I'd pull out my robe and dance. You know how they do, like, in the yeah, yeah, yeah. parties, you, yes. It's true. <laughs> you know what? You have strong auntie energy, and you know what? You, you just need to live that. Live your auntie energy. I just want to be, like, a really fabulous auntie. You know, I want to be the rich auntie. I want to be, like, oh, my child. <laughs> Here I am on my private jets. Come and join me. <laughs> and you can have like really inappropriately invasive opinions on things. Yes. Like, anything because they know you're going to like buy them a pony. <laughs> like that kind I mean, of. That's why, yes. Yes. <laughs> that's why and I don't like, need her ghost. That's why you don't need her ghost because her ghost will never, it will just, it will never stop. It would, it would just be all the time. All the time. <laughs> and then you just, the thing is, auntie energy needs to be in doses. Like imagine 24 7 auntie energy. Like, yeah. Mm. <laughs> okay. All right, so questions. Okay. Let's do this. Question, yes, Q&A. Okay, I'll take the uh, question thing. Y'all remember y'all leave your questions. Let's see, this is technically supposed to end at 9.30, but because we ran over a little bit, let's give ourselves 20 minutes. So we'll aim for 9.40. So let's see how many we can do in 20 minutes. Um, I'm so let's start with- I'd watch the show. I'd watch it too. Mm -hmm. We're awesome. <laughs> NBC, if you're here, give us a talk show. Listen, Ellen had run her course. You can just- Oh my gosh. Her and put us on. Okay. Judgy, judgy, judgy Africans. Like, that's what <laughs> judgy. Okay, so first question number one with four votes. If your main character could meet a character from any other series, who would you want them to meet? Nominate, you can go to Jordan, then I'll answer. Oh my God, that's that's a brutal question. Who thought of, who are you this like evil genius that thought of, I'm like stalling, trying to figure it out. <laughs> Any other series? Okay. Hmm. I am trying to figure it out. Um, all right. So actually, I feel like my character and Rosie's character remind me of her name because I'm blanking white hair. Karina. Karina, there you go. I think they should meet because Karina is sort of evil, right? And no, but she is. She really is. And meanwhile, she, they can she, she's not evil. Well, yes. <laughs> she is a much more ruthless character than Deka. And she would be like, she'd look at Deka and be like, my poor sweet summer child. Come, let me teach you how to be a monster. That's what she'd yeah. do. And I think that they need to like sort of meet up like that. So actually, yes, I think they'd be a good pair. Ah, geez, this is hard because I immediately thought Tari Sai would be a good match for either of your characters. With mm -hmm. Deka, because she's sweet, um, I feel like Tari Sai would be automatically protective of her the way she is of Dio. And with Karina, she would understand the rage behind the unfair system and kind of need to tear it down. Um, I don't know which urge would be strongest because that's Tari Sai's two like warring wolves is just kind of wanting to be loved and have friends and also like really needing to dismantle the injust system. So I don't know, I, I pick them both. They can come to the empire and live in an Iliopa palace. <laughs> wow, y'all are better friends than me because I will be completely <laughs> honest, the first person who came to mind was not neither of y'all, it was Storm from X-Men. <laughs> yes, yes, because they both have white hair. 
the, the, re the, the real reason is a spoiler, but the like reason I'm gonna give y'all is this idea that Storm, she just represents like, Storm is like this, Storm is like a goddess in her own right. She has worshiped as a god in the comics and she's just so powerful. And she's someone who like, like just for so many little black girls, like Storm was like, especially in fantasy, like there were some black characters and like things like contemporary and, and all the other things. But I think in fantasy slash science fiction, like for a lot of us, Storm was that bitch. And so like, mm -hmm. I feel like Karina, she wanna be like Storm, like she'd be like mother, mother. So that's why <laughs> Ooh, did y'all see but that? Did y'all see that like the black and model with like that that was did that whole clip where she was storm and she was walking and cameras flashing? I played that on repeat because I was just like, oh, every time I see it, I shiver. Like, Ooh. yeah, like the dark skin, the yeah, anyway. Nice. Okay. So our next question we have. Why did you choose YA as a genre to write? Was it because you found the genre lacking diversity? Um anyway. I tend to write according to what the story demands, right? So like for me, sometimes stories, they come, I'm actually more so a middle grade writer, which is shocking, but I am, <laughs> I know. Uh, um, but like for me, stories come in different mediums. Sometimes they're movies, sometimes they're TV shows and they come in like different, you know, young adult, middle grader, adult. It just so happened that this story demanded to be told as a young adult story. Um, and I don't think I was thinking of diversity at the time because I was just like, I'm black, she's black. You know, it is what it is. And this is the funny thing is like, I don't know. I don't think people have noticed yet, but like um, my like Deka is the one character that I know of that starts off mixed and ends up black. And I don't think people have picked up on, the, on, on that yet. I'm like, go back and read the book. She starts off and she, yeah. Um, but I remember her daddy. But you, you, this was how she came. And this was sort of what the story demanded because I felt like, especially with the, the lessons and the examinations of the story, when I was thinking of that, like that's, I was at that age, you know, this is, what my little my my older sister's what i missed that like yeah she gets rid of like her gray eyes and all this stuff at the end when she were just, I, oh sorry i'm not gonna Ooh, spoil. okay no, spoilers no spoilers yell everything why not why not <laughs> no spoilers no spoilers um anyway so um that was just you know, at the age that I was when I had sort of the inklings of the story, it was because I was at that age where I was questioning what it meant to be a woman. And you teenage years are the prime years when you are discovering that you're figuring that out. It's the first time you're getting um it's the first time you're getting sexualized and all of these things. So you have to sort of understand those systems. And that is why um it is sort of the age range that it is. A lot of people are like, this is an adult novel, but no, it's not because like this, these are the problems that teenagers are facing. These are the questions that young girls and gender diverse people and LGBTQ people are facing. And that is why it's a young adult novel. Oh, um, not, okay, we're going through me. It's it's out of order on my page, but um, uh, go yeah, ahead. so, I wrote Young Adult because there is something about the coming of age narrative that appeals to everyone at all ages. Not that all ages enjoy YA, but that it's something that we're either in the process of going through or can look back on, on that pivotal moment that kind of defined us for the rest of our lives. And I think that the universality of that process is really beautiful. Um, I also think that YA books tend to, no matter how grim they are, they tend to have a redemption arc. If not for the character, then for the world, like just this idea of hope um, or of empathy even. Because like there, there are YA books that are like making of a villain stories, but even the heart of that is empathy. You can see how they became what they ended up becoming. Um, it's something that can also be present in adult fiction, but isn't always. There's a lot of cynicism in adult fiction, which is also a valid lens if that's the story you're telling, right? But there's something about the redemption of YA that I love. Um, as for diversity and inclusion, 
Um, while that isn't the reason why I write YA in particular, because I think all the genres need more diversity and inclusion, I did want to write it as a love letter to the little black girl, black teen girl I was, and other ones out there who have never seen themselves as the heroine of a book. And specifically for Tari Sai, um, a heroine who comes of age without like without it stemming from physical or sexual violence, which is the narrative that a lot of dark skinned black girls have to go through. She comes of age by finding out how to use, like the world kind of worships Tari Sai because of the council she's in. And she has to find a responsible way to use her privilege, you know, to be open to the oppression towards herself and towards other people. So um, that's why YA appeals to me. I guess I think I agree with all that. Y'all got the good stuff. <clears throat> so I guess the only thing I can really add is I think for me that appeal of YA is just kind of like that coming of age, but just this idea that this is really the first time that it's sort of the character, uh, it's kind of the character who they are in the world, but it's also the first time that the world is really being changed by the character because middle grade, not that like younger readers, younger people can't change the world, but the idea that for most people, this is very the first time that like, the things you're doing, they truly reverberate on like on a grander scale. And I really love that idea of like being able to write stories about where the things the characters do, they have these vast repercussions and they have these vast ways that they ripple and they change and that they, that as much as the characters are going through the arc and the characters are becoming who they need to become, the world is also going through an arc. That's something I found I love writing. And that's something that, it's not that we can't see that in other genres, but I feel like why so much, like this idea that like, your characters can and will change the world, not always for the better, sometimes for the worse. And the idea that it gives you so much space to envision how that change can look and where it can move and how it can become. I feel like I saw that so much more in YA as I was starting out and I was like, this is what I kind of want to discuss with my work. And this is the genre that seems like the most suited for discussing this. And so I think for me, that was why, especially race in particular, why I was like, this is a YA story. Like this is, despite the fact it does get pretty heavy sometimes, like this is a story about two teenagers. This would not work if they were younger and it would not work if they were older. Like it, it can only happen here. Let's see. Okay, also I see PJ, I see you there with the Jalof Rice question. We are not going there tonight because we have already had too much energy with the fighting. PJ, I love you PJ, this is not against you. This is against, we can, the Jalof Rice question. No, I'm putting my foot down there. For some but, Amazing. <laughs> Oh yes, me. We shared. At fun fact: Me and PJ share an editor. She told me the horse and bungalow thing when they were working on it. It was very cute. Um, and we already answered the which why we pick our mid. So okay. Oh, here's a good one. Classic. What is your favorite part of writing? That's, um, God, that's a difficult. Yeah. Can y'all? I, I got to answer. Uh, oh, go for it. Being done. I love finish having, <laughs> I do not enjoy writing. I enjoy having written and I'm going to count it because none of y'all can stop me. <laughs> the moment a story is done is the single best feeling in the entire world because it's like, it's over. You're so <laughs> rude. I, I didn't even realize that could be an answer to the question. What kind of rudeness is this, Rosie? Eh? It's a good question. It's an answer. It counts. It counts. It's a part of the process. Why would you say something so controversial and yet so I brave? <laughs> Like, and now you've like ruined the game for all of us because now we have to then find actual coherent characters. <laughs> it's true. I will say, second to being done, my favorite part of writing is the flow, which is very, very rare. There is a moment when you're not pulling teeth, you're not squeezing blood from a throat from a stone, you're just lost. You're lost in the world. All of these different conversations and all of the different wheels you're trying to keep turning are just there like a well-oiled machine and you just write, you write. And it is so rare, but I think maybe those are the only moments I actually feel like a writer. Not when I'm at publication events, not when I'm signing books, not when I'm reading letters from kind people who liked my book. It's that that is the moment where I feel like I'm the real deal. And it's so rare. And the rest of the time is just anxious imposter syndrome. So <laughs> yes, that is a wonderful feeling. <laughs> Agree with Jordan. Can you guys hear me by the way, without yeah. my- Yeah. Yeah, now um, you're fine. Okay, so like, I definitely agree with you, Jordan. Like when I'm in flow, it is a spiritual experience. Mm -hmm. It 
describe it as light coming in down through my head and up through my fingers and like like typing feels like butter it is amazing like honestly like when i'm in that state i feel like i'm closest to whatever your conception of god or the universe is i feel like i'm connected in that moment and that it's not just me that there's like that i am mm -hmm. and supported held and whatever and that is why i love to write is because in those moments those for me are moments of deep spirituality you know mm -hmm. um everything else sort of sucks i'm not even gonna lie <laughs> Yeah. like I grumble Ooh. and you know and you know it takes like days to, it takes like days or months to get into that state but like once you get there you're there you have to grumble you have to do this just to get there yeah yeah, <laughs> yeah. I guess if I do have to add one thing besides the being done and that's not the flow I would add actually the moment when something you something clicks like for me this isn't always flow though because like this is something it can usually comes after end of days or weeks of struggling with a subplot or with a passage or with something. And like, you just like, you have the, it's like when you have a pieces in a puzzle and like, you just can't fit them together and everything you're trying isn't working. And then suddenly you just turn it one way and it clicks. Like that moment, I feel like I had that more often than flow because that for me feels like those moments like where the hard work and the sweat and the pain was worth it, you know? Cause like the flow, when the flow is happening, it's happening. But like when you get those rare gems in between the struggle, ooh, I live for that too. Y'all ever experience continuous flow? Because like I get to a point in like my write, writing or my rewrite usually towards the end where it's like I'm in continuous flow for days or weeks at a time. And that's when I yeah. crash yeah. and like my whole- See I, call that, see, I call that deadline fear. That's what that is for me. That is a fear <laughs> that the deadline's coming. And that keeps me going. <laughs> I can get into, I'm not sure if that's deadline fear as much as fight or flight. And I, I choose fight because I can't, you know, hide from my publisher very well. Um, They'll find you. They will find yeah, you. They will. Um, like, I, you I am so jealous, Namina. I have never okay. had flow for longer than maybe 12 hours. And those 12 hours will go like that. It's very, it's kind of eerie a little bit. Like it's, you'll just be writing and then all of a sudden it'll be 3 a.m. Um, and it was, mm -hmm. it was literally 3 p.m. before. Like it's just, it's, a, it's an alternate mind state. But um, yeah, it's never, I've never had it like that for, long. So I'm really envious. <laughs> like um, days or weeks at a time, but I have to like push aside everything and like shut mm -hmm. down everything. And then it almost feels like I'm lifting up mm -hmm. and different state. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Okay. Let's see, we have our next one, another classic. What advice do you have for aspiring authors? Who? I'll go first. Um, I have several. First of all, get on Twitter. Twitter is where all the other writers are. It's where we all met each other. Um, and we've never met in person. No, well, I haven't met Rosie in person, but I see you. I met Jordan. Um, we both met Jordan, but not each other. <laughs> yeah, we both. I've never met jo uh, Rosie, Rosie in person, but we text and we call each other all the time. Um, so yeah, go on Twitter um, and find your writing community there. Like I would like look at tags like hashtag writing, hashtag I'm editing, hashtag 5 a.m. Writers Club and sort of follow those. Also un enter writing competitions like hashtag pit mad or pitch madness or D hashtag DV pit because that's where um, not only do you get into the community or see who the community is, you also again meet other people and you might get an agent. Um, the other thing that I would say is, um, and I've said, uh, you are only as good as your community and you're only as good as your critique partner find you a critique partner or several because I have so I have different critique partners for different things right I have different critique partners for like when I have a story I bounce it off of someone and then when I have um when I write the outline that's another and then when I write pages that's another I have one main critique partner my main critique partner is PJ Schweitzer she's here she's in the chat she is the author of the book Horace and Bonwinkle, which is very, very heartwarming. Um, it's about a Boston Terrier and a pot belly pig um, who work on a farm, who live on a farm and solve mysteries. Um, heartwarming, y'all need to buy it. Um, but e PJ is my primary critique partner. And like, when I tell you like our relationship is like, I talk to this woman at least one hour every single day because we check in on each other. We are literal workmates, you know? And like, that's the thing is like, you need, like you need a community you are only as good as your community and also find your critique partner that um 
you can build up to. Because for instance, like I'm not really good with emotion. Like I will write a story, like the action of it, and then I'll layer emotion over it. And so that's why PJ is a really good critique partner because he's extremely good at um, emotion. And so like I'll run it by her how to get the feels right. Right. And then on the other hand, like I'm really good at um, the actual plotting. And so like she'll come to me for that. And so we balance each other out. But she definitely has a strength that I am working up to. And that's what you need. Find people you can work up to. Mm -hmm. I'll piggyback off Nomina and say Twitter is amazing for finding your writing community. It's amazing for opportunities. My agent found me on Twitter. Um, which is another story that I'm about to get into real quick. But I will also say when you can afford to get off Twitter, <laughs> like when you have a solid writing community, maybe when you've got a book deal or at least enough short stories under your belt published in journals that, you know, people know who you are in the publishing community. Like this isn't gonna work for everyone, but I, my writing has improved so much since I just kind of noped out of Twitter. Like just like, because you can, not only is it time consuming, but I found the feedback loop, especially if you've done a good job of being in writing communities, can make you feel like you're failing all the time. Everyone is always announcing a book deal, a movie deal, um, how many words they wrote that day, just thousands and thousands, you know, like, and even if you're actually doing okay, like you're a good writer, there's always someone out there doing something you wish you were better at. And, you know, it's it's this weirdness of being happy for them while also wondering like oh I thought I I thought I'd gotten here it looks like I should be up here to be a real writer which you never actually feel like from what I've heard from some of the most successful writers I know they're like oh yeah I don't feel like a writer I'm just like you've literally been on the bestseller list like a thousand times how do you not feel that way but that's just how it is you know so um, take care of your mental health um, for sure. Um, also, I share my kind of unusual route to publishing every chance I get because I don't think it occurs to a lot of people. Um, I, I am a novel person. I'm a long form writer. I am not by any means the best short story writer, but I wrote short stories um, just to kind of get a little more connections within the publishing field and because I had short story ideas and I didn't have time to write a novel about it. And that's how I got my agent. I didn't query. I did not query Ray Bearer, which is like unheard of these days. Another thing that's unheard of, Ray Bearer wasn't even finished, also unheard of these days. Um, basically, it is way easier to query short stories than it is novels because a short story query is just a few sentences. And if you get in enough short story publications, that increases your chances of getting into more because you say that in your query letter. I've been in this magazine and this magazine. Um, and um, yeah, that's people, publishing people read those like they really like literary magazines they like locusts they like strange horizons they like all of those and so they notice and they might notice if you don't have representation and they'll ask which is what happened to me it's kind of this whole like fairy tale you know <laughs> like i yeah scenario that never happens which is that an agent asks to represent you rather than you querying them so go for it um that's another route oh yeah i feel <laughs> like they Sorry, that again yeah. I said I found my agent on um Twitter via DV pit they liked my pitch um and that was how I got my agent so yeah hashtag DV pit hashtag pit Matt all these things you can get agent for that because I queried for over 12 years and didn't get anywhere so yeah it's possible also Jordan your stories <laughs> my stories what <laughs> your stories are real who does that who gets represented that way only you <laughs> I want to read the short story sometime. I didn't know you wrote short stories, so yeah. I only but, got um, published. I think, I think the reason why you don't hear it is that most people, if they write short stories, they mostly write short stories and they write tons of them and they're brilliant. And other people, if they write novels, they mostly only write novels. Um, and you, you, know, you don't always see one as a past to the other, but apparently that's a thing. So <laughs> anyway. And I guess, and I'll just add mine real quick because we're starting to run up to time. Um, mm -hmm. But I guess for me, since, they both mentioned sort of like writing community and all that. That's super important. I think mine will be more towards geared towards craft. And I think one of the biggest things, at least I know for me being an aspiring author, the hardest thing for me was actually getting the like mindset to actually finish something. And I think this is something a lot of people I know too. Like I start a book, but I can never finish. I start a book. And the truth is, at least the first couple times finishing something has absolutely nothing to do with your actual quality as a writer and nothing about your skill. 
and it's truly just an endurance in the same way that like a marathon is like you don't have to be the fastest to be able to complete a marathon like it's a completely different mindset to like be a good runner and be a marathon runner you know and be a good marathon runner is a whole different thing and so i think my biggest thing that honestly like when you're starting out i don't mean this to sound like don't care about your quality that's not what i'm saying but really learn to like hone those skills of like actually like when you're starting projects when you can try and finish them like even if it's like you're not in love with it like just getting to the end is going to teach you so much and having a whole draft you can work with and look at even if you know like ooh, 30 percent of the way through i just lost it but like just having that hole to look at and be able to work with and be like mm, i lost it at 30 percent through but like this is where it went where i was trying to go here like it changes working with finished work changes and improves you so much faster than starting and then like just starting 18 million things and never finishing them like you'll learn way more like finishing one thing that you got all the way through to the end and that like you learn there like this is how it feels to complete a story arc this is how it feels to go through this like like it's it sounds weird when you haven't done it but like writing is as much muscle memory as it is actual like the creative thinking and like the more you finish a story you the more you understand how it feels when a story is working like with working on race two now, just because I have the experience of now finishing several books, it's like, oh, I can feel faster. Oh no, this plot thread's not gonna work. This is going off the rails. This is not like, versus before I used to waste so much time just trying things, I just try it. And as soon as it started feeling bad, I just toss it. And the problem with that was like, yeah, my instinct that it wasn't working was right, but I didn't continue long enough to understand fully why it wasn't working. And so that's something that you can just really hone. So whenever possible, no matter how much you feel it sucks, no matter how much you're like, this is wrong, this is bad, my favorite authors have never put out shit like this, like, trust me, they are writing shit like this, you are seeing their most edited versions, I'm just telling you, their first draft's nasty. Um, no matter how disgusting it feels, get yourself to the end of it, because you're going to learn so much more, you're going to be so much closer than if you give up. Also write outlines, because they help you finish a draft. You'll know where you end. You too. Also, outlines, even though even though you can get lost in outlines, you do them, they kind of feel like finishing a book, even though they're totally not. Like when you get through an outline and you know everything that happened, you feel kind of like you wrote a book. And then that reality comes crashing down when you're on chapter one, page one. <laughs> but, you know, <laughs> that temporary. Okay, and I, yes, I think we have time for one more question before we need to give it back to the bookstore. And so for our last question at the top here is, who was your favorite author to read when you need inspiration? That's a good one to end on. Oh, um, all right. This is a controversial question. Um, and it is a controversial question. I think every question is controversial <laughs> during this chat. Um, it's a, okay, so I'll be very honest. Um, when in my formative period of writing, my favorite author used to be J.K. Rowling. I would read the, the Harry Potter books all the time. I would read them over and over. You know, I sought inspiration from them. But lately, um, as things about her have become wow. extremely clear, I actually, it's very sad. Um, I, I, I can't engage in that world anymore. You know, it's just, it's, it's really uncomfortable for me. So it's very sad because she was such a formative part of like my writing journey. She's the reason where, why, like I didn't realize you could have a career as a writer until she came along. Um, but I can't support that. Like, you know, for me, trans rights are everybody's rights. So like, <laughs> I like, um, so she has fallen off my bookshelf um, and now leaving space for other people like Rosie like Jordan, you know, people who actually, no, quite seriously. Um, Cause like when I, like that's the reason why I asked them is because I read their books, I loved their books and I felt seen in their books and I felt happy in their books, you know? And that's something when you are a black writer or a black person in general, you're never seen in books, right? So it's like when I read their books, it's always sort of a shock to me to find myself reflected there. Other writers that I look up to and that I um, enjoy and admire during this time are King Johnson, who wrote This Is My America, um, and Christina Hammonds Reed, who wrote um, The Black Kids. These are the authors that I'm reading right now that I'm recommending to everyone right now because these are the authors that make me feel seen. Um, also, one author 
that's like sort of an aside that I read all the time, or rather I read him to fall asleep is John Mortimer, um, who is like one of my favorite OG writers, because he wrote this book called, Rump these series of books called Rumple of the Bailey. And like my dad, and he's sort of dear to me because my dad introduced him to me. And he writes these series about like this um, fat British lawyer, the fatness is, is part of the point, who refuses to, um, he refuses to retire and smokes nasty cigars, much to the dismay of everyone. And he's just, Rumpel is always firmly himself. And I really enjoy that. So like, I will always read those books over and over again. Yeah. Oh, you remember those stories. Yeah. Rumpel uh, of the Bailey always makes me happy. Um, gosh, it's a, be a beautiful answer, Namina. Also, I, I've oh, never heard of John Mortimer and I need to, need to read this. Oh, um, yeah. Yeah, my... I, it would depend on for what. Um, lately, I've been really intentional with going to books that I know I've loved and been blown away by to try and um, like like specifically going back to them because of something I loved and I want to get my r mind around how they did it. And so it depends on what I'm looking for. If I'm looking for prose, um, I, I tend to go back lately a lot to Circe by Madeline Miller, which is just, it's its one of the most beautifully written books I've ever read. A lot of people are more familiar with Song of Achilles, which was also excellent, but will literally like tear your heart out in several pieces. Um, but yeah, I'll just read a chapter and even just hearing someone communicate so beautifully with word economy, which is something I still struggle with, which is conveying so much with so little, with so few words. You can tell when someone who writes a novel is also a good poet or a good short story writer, because those are the two literary art forms in which every word matters. You cannot waste, you cannot ramble. Um, and so uh, Madeline Miller for word prose, when it comes to um, humanity, like, like, I don't know, it's hard to describe what I get out of Maya Angelou, except that I feel like I've had, like every single character, either in her memoirs, which are true or more fictional, you feel like you've met them. And I, it's, it feels like somehow she's managed to capture whatever humanity is and put it in a bottle for you to like smell or, you know, I don't know. I, it's just like, they never feel fake. They never feel like caricatures like, um, and so that's that's pretty much the number one thing I've always wanted to do is to be able to accurately and empathetically um, represent people. And so, um, and in terms of just story narrative to people, Kwame Ambalia with his Tristan Strong books, they are so good and they do humor so well. They do humor and tragedy and processing grief and just zaniness, like everything that makes an excellent middle grade book. He just, he just, it just is blown out of the water with those books. And obviously like the representation of like both African and black American mythologies in his book is so cool. Um, one more is Gail Carson Levine. She's probably yeah. the I, I'm a writer. I found her books when I was nine or 10 and I still have my original Scholastic Fair copies, paperback from when I was nine, they're falling apart. They're literally disintegrating because of how much I read and love these books. I took them to bed, I took them in the car, I took them in the bathroom, I put them in my backpack. Like they were just, those stories portray people, but also especially young girls so empathetically and so diversely. Um, if any of you haven't read Two Princesses of Bamar, it's one of the first books I feel ever published for young girls, nine to 10, in which you have both like the tomboy and the feminine girl, and both of them are celebrated as themselves. Like, it's not like, you know, oh, girly stuff is dumb and the cool girl is the one who only wants a sword and a horse. And it's not like, oh, boyish stuff is inappropriate for girls. Like you should be gentle. It's just like, no, these girls are themselves and they can <laughs> fight dragons, you know, um, and, it's so special to me. Um, so yeah, those are some pretty big influences for me. Yes, and gosh, I guess for me, I'm similar to Jordan in the sense that I go back to different sort of mentor texts, depending on what I need in the moment where I am, who I am as a writer, who I am. I go to different books as a reader than I do as a writer. So when I'm thinking kind of who most as a writer for me, 
Gail Carson Levine's another one. And for me, there's two of them that stick out for her, which is Ella Enchanted, which is, of course, everyone. Yes. That book just yes. means so much to one, especially because her sort of depiction of abuse in that book and the depiction of Ella and her abusive family and like kind of seeing that on the page and like seeing that like being treated like with so much like sort of depth and understanding and like really showing that like, yeah, you might not be being physically harmed, but like this is a very real sort of like situation to deal with. I know that's something I took a lot with rates and kind of with um depicting like how are these characters how is Malik processing the abuse that happened to him that was something that had such an impact on me as a child and then her other book this one is actually one of her lesser known books but Dave at Night I love 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 Dave at Night and one thing I remember is that Dave at Night I don't want to say love interest because like it's a book about children he has like the lightest lightest crush on her but like basically like the main girl in that that was the very first time a black girl I read and I was in second grade but like yeah like Dave's a little black and it's like he meets her at like this jazz house and like she's seen as like to him like he's in the orphanage so he sees this girl she's just the coolest thing in the world like her family does jazz like for her she for her for him he represents she represents like just this big world and bright and just seeing a little black girl sort of representing all that and like just in that way i was just like that has never left me so that feeling there so the girl carson levine for those two things um i love false prince jennifer nelson the like sort of action pack you the, the idea that the narrative can lie to you is like, I know the unreliable narrator, that's something you're supposed to learn in school. I missed that, I guess. But like the idea that the narrator can lie to you is something that I've never seen until her work. And like, I remember that was the first time I was like, well, I love books, but like, I need a book that makes people feel like this. I gotta do something like that. So The False Prince by her, Francesca Lea Block, because just the way she blends like just fairy tale surrealness, supernatural spirituality, and with her stuff, like her stuff, her stuff makes you feel weird, but a good weird. Um, then Subba to hear just what she has done in the YA fantasy space and like what an Ember in the Ashes did to break through for like non-Western based YA fantasies. Like I will never forget like walking through and I'm walking with Ember and I'm just like in an internship in college. I'm just like, oh my God, oh my God, books like this can exist. Oh my God, it just blew my mind. And then another one for me is Edwidge Dantica, which is weird because this time yeah. kind of stuff she writes not the kind of stuff I don't necessarily want to write like her. I've never but the way she makes Oh, she's a Haitian um, author, Crick Crack. Crick Crack on her is just, it's a short story collection. It's not actually a novel, but when I tell you this will change the way you see fiction, mm. just the way the humanity she brings to sort of the black girl experience, the literary weight she gives to it. Like when I see like the way Namna mentioned that um, the way she seems, see, she feels seen in like our books and books by other black writers now, Edwidge Danticat, I I'm, I'm think I'm pronouncing it wrong, Edwidge Danticat perhaps, but yeah. the way, her books make that feel, I feel like I've been chasing that feeling ever since I read her in college. And I I am still learning how to, I obviously cannot replicate that because she is her own master, but like my version of that feeling, how I can bring that into my work. I feel like that's something I've been chasing my entire life. So those are for me when I say like kind of, I call them mentor texts in the sense like they are the text that taught me what writing means to me. And they're all very different, but I'm like, I feel like, if you look at my books, like if you look at those, you can be like, oh, I can see how this affected how Rosie views story and what writing is. I'm like feverishly writing this down. <laughs> like I need to read this. <laughs> the link is in the chat. You can buy it from the bookstore. Oh, there Whoa. we go. Okay, great. Crack. No, crack, crack is, it'll mess you up, man. It'll mess you up. <laughs> I'm ready to hurt so good. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Um, okay. Okay, so I think we are at the end of our time here. Everyone, thank you so much for coming for this. And thank you for keeping up when we're having some like tech stuff. Like, as we said, live TV, y'all, this happened in real time. Um, but just, yes, this event just means so much. And like Domina mentioned, just getting to be here and be with two other amazing Black women writers and have this space and talk about this. Domina, the Gilded Ones is amazing. You are amazing. Everything you and this book have done is just it's just so beautiful and wonderful to watch and just to see it all continue to happen. And I know we will be in your DMs later talking shit, but for now, just want to celebrate you. And I just hope you had the best launch week. I have, I have had the most amazing launch week. Um, thank every, thank you everyone so much for being here. This is amazing. I am so excited. And it, it was so great because we actually got to just chill, uh, which is what I wanted for my launch week. We've